Welcome to our webinar, Understanding Student Loan Options, Strategies for Today and Tomorrow. My name is Catherine Wall. I am a Partner Experience Manager for GreenPath based out of Michigan. I'm joined today by Doug Brady. Doug, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Brady. I'm in business development. I've been working with GreenPath for about 11 years, and I work with various credit unions across 17 states uh, in the U.S. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that, Doug. So, per our slide, I just want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording today's webinar, so all phones are muted to reduce the background noise. So if you have any questions, please submit them via chat, and our amazing colleague, Luca Pelga, will collate the questions and we'll answer as many as we can towards the end of the, today's presentation. Now, for those of you who are new to WebEx, chat can be found in the navigation bar. So just hover and you'll be able to, to click on the chat. Um, you want to select, when you chat, you want to um, select host, presenter, and panelist. That's really important because if you do not include panelists, Luke will not be able to see that chat. Okay, so I am now going to just drag this bar out of the way so people don't have to see that during the presentation. So where do we start? We are living in unprecedented times. In a very short period of time, millions have found themselves unemployed, underemployed, or working at home. But life goes on. Currently, millions of people have student loans and others heading to college in the fall are applying for student loans for the first time. Obviously, we can't comprehensively cover the topic of student loans in 45 minutes. However, we plan to share crucial information and more importantly, key website resources that will build on the information we share today. This information will help you navigate your journey with student loans. For those new to GreenPath, we are a national nonprofit financial counseling and education company, and tens of thousands of people have benefited from our services year over year since 1961. GreenPath's goal is to empower people to lead financially healthy lives. Or, as I like to say, we want to help you get value from every dollar earned and spent. Now, following this webinar today, you can take advantage of a free counseling session with a GreenPath financial wellness expert to discuss your spending plan, housing situation, and or options for dealing with debt. Why is this important? Well, what if the Green Pass Financial Wellness Expert helped you find an extra $50 a month in your budget and you chose to use that $50 each month to pay down your student loans faster? How much interest might that save you? What if you saved that interest um, in your employer's 401k and you received the employer match, which boosted your contribution? That is financial empowerment. So more on Green Pass at the end of our presentation. Um, we'll also address our student loan counseling at that time too. So Doug, do you want to cover today's agenda? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Catherine. So today's agenda items are pretty straightforward. We're gonna start with those who might be struggling with their student loans. Uh, they've already accumulated the student loan debt, uh, gone through college, gone to graduate school or whatnot and they might be concerned about options, they might be concerned about uh, accumulating interest or forbearance, uh, and what options might be available to them even in these uh, current economic times and, and climate with the pandemic. Then we're gonna shift our focus to strategies to repay student loan debt. What options are available to those out there with student loans to repay those debts, uh, to lower payments, uh, alleviate tax concerns, things of that nature? And then we're gonna shift focus to planning for those who are planning to attend college. What might be some good options or alternatives to take a look at? Uh, how might they limit the amount of student loan debt they might accumulate as they go through their college career? And then we plan to hang around for a few minutes afterwards for a Q&A session, because we know there's probably gonna be a lot of good questions out there that we would like to address. Thanks, Catherine. Awesome, thanks, Doug. So we've chosen to start our discussion about student loans with the topic of loans in default because we see that as a big issue. That's why most people are reaching out to Green Path. 
So to those who have student loans in default, no, you're not alone. Here the slides, there are millions of people just like you who are, who are experiencing difficulty. Now, ironically, this is good news. Well, why? Well, because with so many people needing assistance, the government has had to create programs to help. And we're gonna cover two specific programs, rehabilitation and consolidation um, in today's presentation. Now, as mentioned earlier, the slide also contains web links to the government student aid website where you can go following today's webinar for more information about getting out of default. These links are gonna be included in a packet that we are going to email to you following today's webinar. So don't worry about trying to copy them down. Um, but we do wanna take a moment to reference the impact of COVID-19 as it relates to student loans and interest deferment. So Doug, do you wanna take time to expand on the effects of the CARE Act on student loans? Yeah, let's cover that. It's clearly uh, relevant to the current times. So most of you may be familiar or had heard the term the CARES Act, which passed uh, the stimulus. Uh, uh, it also included some increases in unemployment, but there was a effect on student loans. If you go to the Nelnet website or you go to the coronavirus assistance uh, link that we have provided, you'll see that all federally all federally owned by the U.S. Department of Education student loans have had forbearance payments for six months, starting March 13th through September 30th, 2020. Also, no interest is accumulating on all federal student loans through that same time period. Uh, there's nothing anybody has to do. It's automatically been done by the servicers. If you do have any questions about your specific student loans, federally insured student loans, you should reach out to your specific servicer to ask them any questions that you might have. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate that. So, personally, I find it easier to learn through stories and examples, and behavioral science says that this is typical for a lot of people. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to talk about the programs available to get student loans back on track in the context of helping Tanya. So let's meet Tanya. It's been a struggle dealing with her student loans, and so much so that she tended to ignore the situation. However, she now owes over $60,000 and she's over $14,000 in arrears. But where does she start? Now, I've had a couple of people who've chatted in that maybe the, my voice may be breaking up. So I'm gonna take myself off my headset and I'm gonna put myself on speakerphone and let me know if, if situation. All righty. So Tanya's first step is compiling information about her loans. Most importantly, she needs to find what company is managing her loan. Typically, we call that the servicer. Um, there are multiple ways to find out this information, including the National Student Loan Data System. Again, we've included a web link to the website here. We've also included a link to a list of services and their contact information. As many people know the name of the company, their servicer, but they aren't sure how to reach them. Some people have found the student loan servicer on their credit report. Um, for loans greater, uh, sorry, in default for greater than seven years though, the information will likely be removed from the credit report. However, that doesn't mean that the debts have disappeared. Collectors can still um, try to get payments. Tanya's loans are all federal student loans, which means the company that handles her loans forwards the payments to the Department of Ed. Sadly, Tanya's found that her loans are in default. But what does this mean? Well, if you're dealing with a subsidized or unsubsidized loan, these go into default once the loan is more than nine months or 270 days behind. When a federal loan is in default, there are consequences. The lender can enforce collections by intercepting tax refunds, that's pretty common. Garnishing wages and freezing bank accounts, less common. Garnishing means the loan holder can order your employer to withhold up to 15% of your disposable pay to collect on your defaulted debt without taking you to court. This withholding, garnishment, continues until your defaulted loan is paid in full or removed from default. 
The challenge is having defaulted loan, having loans in default rather, also blocks eligibility for financial aid, including grants and additional federal loans. Sadly, when loans go to collections, hefty fees are added to the loan balance too. Now, fortunately, Tanya doesn't have any private loans, but for completeness, I wanted to cover them. Now, the date when a private loan charges off can vary. Um, you would need to refer to the original loan contract for more information. Some private loans have been known to go into default as early as one missed payment. To enforce collections, however, the private lender would have to take the borrower to court first. This process would have to follow the state, law, state laws of where the borrower resides. So it's important to note, if you are in default on your student loans, federal student loans, the entire balance of the loan, principal and interest, becomes immediately due. It's called acceleration. Once your loan is accelerated, you no longer have access to deferment or forbearance options or to a choice of a repayment plan. Now, more details can be found on the collection section of the studentaid.gov website so by clicking on the, the, the link there. So we want to take a look at how, what are the options for Tanya having these student loans in default? How can she cure them? Well, the first option is rehabilitation. Tanya would need to set up a rehabilitation agreement by contacting her servicer or the outside collector handling her account. It's very important that Tanya get any agreement in writing. Now, under a typical loan rehabilitation agreement, Tanya's loan holder or servicer will determine a reasonable monthly payment amount that is equal to 15% of her annual discretionary income. But Tanya can negotiate further reductions by providing her expenses. The servicer can uh, give her a, a kind of workout document, a budget sheet. Now, for Tanya's subsidized or unsubsidized loans, uh, for this rehab program, she must make nine on-time payments in a 10-month period. If she had any Perkins loans, these would require nine on-time payments in a nine-month period. Now, upon completion of the rehab program, although the late payments before the default remain, the negative credit history of the default on Tanya's credit report will be erased. And this can be a great advantage for Tanya because she's hoping to purchase a home in the future. Better credit will lead to a lower interest rate and in payment for her mortgage. Now, if Tanya were experiencing any garnishment, this would typically halt after the fourth payment. But in the interim, she would be making loan payments through the garnishment and the rehabilitation promise program. And, and that could cause some financial stress in the short term. Now, consolidation is another option to cure a student loan in default. Let's kind of take a look. It's relatively easy. You can apply online. It can be quick in comparison to the rehab. But this program doesn't clear the bad credit history. So if Tanya wasn't considering buying a home in the near future, but instead found her loans were going to be sent to collections or she was about to be garnished, she might choose to consolidate her loans because it's a quicker fix. Now, for completeness, we should mention settlement and bankruptcy. Now, these are not typical. For a settlement, the government may remove fees, though, and this is why this can be important. However, they're going to expect the full balance of the original loan to be paid in full, and most people don't have that type of money. However, if there was a relative who was open to helping, you know, a person can contact the servicer and see what they can offer, in some respects, negotiate. With regards to bankruptcy, uh, oops, sorry, that was a little ahead of me. Let me give me one sec. Um, with regards to bankruptcy, less than 1% of people could qualify to have their debts discharged in a bankruptcy into those student loan debts. Um, so highly unlikely, but we wanted to include the link just so you can check out those requirements. Uh, Doug, do you want to take it from here? Yes, thanks, Catherine. So, I think repayment strategies, and I'd like to introduce you to David. Uh, let's take a look at David's situation. Growing up, David always wanted to be an educator. He wanted to be a teacher. So he went to college and earned a teaching certificate. Uh, he worked part-time jobs when he could, uh, but he covered the bulk of his tuition and educational expenses with student loans. David was successful in achieving his American dream of becoming a teacher and graduating with a bachelor's in education, and he did obtain a teacher certificate in his state. 
he was also successful in landing a full-time teacher's position in a school district he wanted to work in. The starting salary was $36,599. However, David had also accumulated over $28,000 in student loan debt. So let's take a look at how David's student loans might impact his financial wellness and what options might be available to David. As you could see, with a starting loan balance of $28,650, we assume an average interest rate of 5%. Interest rates on student loans have been varying um, from 6 to 7% down to as low as 3 or 4% as recently. So we're assuming a 5% average interest rate for simplicity's sake for this scenario. David will have 10 years to pay back his loans. With interest, his monthly payments will be $303.88 per month. Over the course of those 10 years, David will pay back $36,465.24. Now, David's gross monthly income before taxes, insurance, or retirement contributions is going to be about $3,049 per month. If we assume David is single with a filer status with modest medical benefit costs uh, and maybe some small contributions to uh, a 401k, 403b uh, scenario, David might take home $2,500 a month or less. $300 a month out of that $2,500 is a car payment for most people. It's a big chunk of change, and it can have a drastic impact on anyone's budget. Can David afford the $300 a month? Maybe. In a lot of scenarios, a lot of folks might be able to. If he lives with family or he shares rent with a roommate or he lives close to work or where he doesn't have to have transportation or he uses public transit. But uh, that's not always the case for most folks uh, around the country. Are there other options available for David? Yes, let's go ahead and take a look. The first option we want to take a look at is public service loan forgiveness. Forgiveness, uh, public service loan forgiveness can be a great option for those who want to uh, go into public service and have a portion of their debts forgiven. With David's scenario, uh, he, the, with the public service loan forgiveness, the remaining balance is going to be forgiven. This is only applicable to federal direct loans. With this program, you make 120, 120 qualifying monthly payments, and this is, you was required to work for full time with a qualified employer, and there's no tax on forgiveness. Now, since he was working for a public school system, which is a branch of government, he'd be eligible for this public service loan forgiveness. David would also be eligible to lower his monthly payment based on his adjusted gross income. David would be eligible for the single filer standard deduction uh, for 2020, which is $12,400, which again, before any other deductions for retirement contributions or healthcare contributions, would bring his adjusted gross income down to $24,399. Now, with the, I, the income-based repayment calculator that we're gonna talk about IBR in a few moments, based on his adjusted gross income, David would only pay $70.80 a month. So David is going to pay $8,496 over the next 10 years. Um, and Catherine, next screen, please. Thank you. Uh, so as you can see, his adjusted gross income is $24,399. His new payment is going to be $70.80 a month. He's only going to pay back $8,496 over the next 10 years. And he's going to, the amount forgiven is going to be over $20,000. Now, one of the keys to this public service loan forgiveness program uh, is that there is no income tax going to be uh, levied against the amount forgiven, which is a significant difference compared to some of the other programs. So let's talk about what qualified employment is for the public service loan forgiveness program. It's, pretty, it's working for the government at any level, which includes federal, state, local, and even tribal governments. Uh, qualified employment is also not-for-profit uh, 501c3 organizations. If you choose to serve full-time in the AmeriCorps or Peace Corps for a couple of years or a, a few months, any qualifying payments that you make during that service can count towards the 120 payments. What does not qualify for qualified employment 
is labor unions, political organizations, or government contractors. We've also included a link here to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness page on the studentaid.gov website for further information about this particular program. So let's take a look at teacher forgiveness. David could also take a look at the teacher forgiveness program. Under the teacher loan forgiveness program, if you teach full-time for five complete and consecutive academic years, and it's very important, in a low-income school or educational service agency and meet some other basic qualifications, you may be eligible for forgiveness of up to $17,500 on direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans and federal Stafford loans. But David uh, had elected to teach in a school district that did not serve low-income schools, so he would not be eligible for this program, but we did want to highlight that this program is available for teachers in certain situations and scenarios. So let's take a look at income-driven repayment options. If you don't work for a qualified employer that qualifies for public service loan forgiveness, there are other options and programs out there to alleviate the monthly payments and student loan debt. The big four that we're gonna take a look at today uh, is revised pay as you earn, uh, which is called repay, the pay as you earn, pay, income-based repayment plan or IBR, and income contingent repayment plan. So the first one of those pr programs is the revised uh, pay as you earn. Uh, next screen, Catherine, please. Thank you. The revised pay as you earn percent of discretionary income, and we have provided a link to the income-driven options on these slides that you can go and play with some calculators and have more questions answered and find out more information. Every year, you must update your income and family size annually. Now, this is what the only of the four programs that we're going to talk about, that the married uh, tax filing status for married borrowers is not considered. They do count for the repay program, uh, discretionary income, and income from both spouses in the relationship, in the marriage. Also, this program is not eligible for PLUS loans that are made to parents. The next program is the pay as you earn. This is also based on 10% discretionary income. You also must recertify your income and annualize annually. However, the difference between the pay and the pay is that married filing status is considered. And we're going to talk a little bit more just exactly what that advantage means in a couple of minutes. Uh, again, no plus loans are made to parents. Uh, uh, does not qualify for PLUS loans made to parents. The next program, which is, is essentially what David and Shale have used, is an income-driven repayment, uh, income-based repayment program, or IBR. Payments based on 10%, 15% of discretionary income, 10% um, if you're a new borrower, 50% if you're student loans are a little bit older, you will need to speak to your servicer to find out what the qualifying cutoff date for that is. This repayment plan is good for both uh, program uh, and direct federal loans, parent plus loans and consolidation loans, which include at least one parent plus loan are not eligible for this program. However, also too, married tax filing status is also considered, so that can also have an effect on the payment on this program. The last program that we're gonna take a look at is the Income Driven Repayment Program, or uh, I'm sorry, the Income Contingent Repayment Program, ICR. Payments based on 20% of discretionary income. As you can see that this one is not quite as favorable with the percentage of payment as it is on the other three. However, this is the only option that is available for parent plus loans. Again, certification on income and family size must be done annually. Uh, and married uh, tax filing status is considered for this program. Now, for all four of these options, uh, at the end, depending on the, whether these loans were for undergraduate or graduate, any balance remaining after 20 or 25 years of repayments, 20 years for undergraduate, 25 years for graduate, will be forgiven. 
So if you make 20 years of payments on this program and you had just an astronomical amount of student loan debt that you just felt like you're never gonna pay off, that balance can be forgiven. However, there can be some tax obligations to the IRS for unearned income. You would wanna to speak with a CPA to find out more information about that. So now let's take a look at the tax strategies that we were talking about for married couples and spouses. Couple of the loan op, a couple of loan repayment options that we took a look at said that uh, the, marrying, uh, the married filing status is considered. So if you are married and filed joint, for those programs where the status is considered, they are gonna count both incomes of both spouses, and then therefore the discretionary income is going to be higher. However, if you're married and file separately, then only the borrower's discretionary income is gonna be considered and the other spouse's income is not gonna be considered for those programs where it says that the filing status matters. To be quite candid for a personal situation, this is something that my, my wife and I did. Uh, my wife attended law school and uh, she accumulated student loan debt to go to graduate school for her law degree. Uh, she is enrolled in the public service loan forgiveness program. Uh, and we are also married and filing separately so that her payments are based solely on her income. Uh, she does work for a government agency. So what you do wanna do is you wanna speak with a qualified CPA because there can be some tax ramifications depending on uh, deductions and write-offs and things of that nature for your specific situation. So you do wanna take a look at how it can affect your tax situation overall and how it also would affect uh, affect the payment situation as well. So now we're gonna turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Doug, I appreciate that. So we deliberately started today's presentation addressing the student loan delinquency concerns. Um, we just, we know and we see that demand every day through, through Green Path. Um, However, we also want to be sure that anyone starting on their higher education journey understands how important it is to make smart decisions to avoid being overburdened with student loans when they leave college. And so it's really important that we added this portion um, into the webinar. And, and this is the more happier part of it. You know, somebody planning for college, it's great to see um, our young people heading and starting their, their careers. Um, so the next part of our webinar, we're gonna follow our high school graduate, Elena, and, and take a look at her journey. But what I did want to ask, and how I wanted to kick off this session, is ask you, ask you, what advice would you give Elena? Or better yet, if you could give your younger self one piece of advice before you started your higher education journey, what would it be? I would love if you would chat in, take a minute, chat in your answers. Luke is gonna capture all of this wonderful advice that you have. And we're going to compile it into a packet, and we're going to share that out um, when we send out the slides and, and et cetera for the webinar today. So take a minute, chat in again, one piece of advice that you would have given your, your, um, your younger self before you started your higher education journey. Just chat those in. That would be great to see. So Elena is excited to graduate high school, and she's ready for college. However, Elena needs help to avoid the pitfalls of graduating college with debt so high that she can't afford the payments. A really important step is getting some idea of what kind of salary she will receive when she graduates from college. This is going to be an estimate based on her career choice, but it's an important place to start because how will Elena know what she can afford to pay back in student loan payments after she graduates if she doesn't know what her likely income is? If Elena changes her major, she should recalculate to see what's affordable and what has changed. But let's take a step back and ask Elena, um, is college the right choice for her? As she looks through the Bureau of Labor and Statistics website, which we shared through the link income projection, does she see other careers that she's interested in that have good salaries that require maybe an apprenticeship or a trade school? If Elena's choice of career requires a four-year degree, it's important she realizes that the cost of college can vary dramatically. Elena has toured several in-state colleges, uh, but also an out-of-state private college that's offering some scholarship money. 
well, would community college make sense? Elena hasn't considered community college yet, but it would be a great option to consider. So we should take a look at those costs. Also, Elena should check out the performance statistics for the colleges that she's interested in attending. What graduation rates do they have? The website we've shared also provides statistics on salaries after graduation. All of these are important, so check out the college scorecard. Now, I'm grateful that my children receive scholarships and we have some creative ways to keep the cost of lodging and board affordable. These help keep the cost of college manageable for our children and allow them to graduate with a, without a large student loan burden. Now, with some creative planning, Elena can also significantly reduce the cost of college. So we're going to explore how different choices can either increase or ideally decrease the cost. Finally, Elena could strategically choose a career that would allow her to take advantage of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program that Doug mentioned earlier in the webinar. But obviously, it doesn't make sense to choose a career you hate based on a repayment plan. Um, but it makes sense to explore all the options just to keep that student loan debt and the repayments as low as possible. So Elena is considering studying business. Um, one of her colleges of choice is the University of Michigan, the Big Ten College. And it comes with a Big Ten price. Now, take a look at the per semester pricing for tuition. So in state, $8,237. Now, going to an in-state college funded by Michigan taxpayers obviously keeps dollars um, down in terms of tuition because it's subsidized. For comparison, check out the out-of-state cost, $26,000. That is serious money. But what about community college? Some students choose to go to community college for their associate's degree and transfer to a four-year college for their junior or senior years. It can be a really smart way to keep costs manageable. Some students commute to community college too, and, and they may even keep their part-time job that they have in high school to help with expenses. However, if Elena chooses this option, it will be key to make sure the credits she earns at the community college are transferable to the four-year college that she wants to attend um, to finish out her degree. So she will need to confirm with the admission staff at the University of Michigan, that's where she goes, that they accept credits from Schoolcraft College for those classes that she's taking. But the cost of college is not solely about tuition. Look at these estimates for books, room and board, and miscellaneous expenses. They almost double the annual cost of college. So maybe Elena can use the college to save on board and lodging expenses. But not many high school students are ready to make this kind of sacrifice because they want the full college experience. But doing this exercise is Elena's opportunity to understand the full cost and decide if it's truly worth it. So the link here to the College Navigator website would allow Elena to compare all the colleges that she's interested in attending and see what those true costs are, or good estimates are likely to be. So, if you were Elena's parents, I bet that community college looks very attractive right now. Um, but it's Elena's life, and she needs to decide what's important to her. She has to compare colleges and make sure that her choice, choices meet her needs. Elena can also work to reduce the cost of college by using various strategies, some of which we've included on this slide. Scholarships and grants are great because they reduce the cost directly. That's money that comes straight off the top line. However, they are generally awarded on a first-come, first-served basis. If you believe that you may be eligible for grants, such as a Pell Grant, which was a maximum of $6,345 for 2020, the full 2020 semester, applications have to be submitted as soon as possible. And this is typically October of the year prior to attendance. So a lot of things that we're talking about now, this is work Elena and her parents have done you know, in between her junior and senior years um, in terms of in that summer. Typically, um, you know, this eligibility is based on the expected family contribution, the cost of attendance and enrollment status. Now, in our case, for Elena, um, she can actually use the financial aid estimate tool maybe in the summer of a junior, uh, summer of a junior, or sorry, the summer in between her junior and senior years she could have gone on to the financial aid estimate tool on the studentaid.gov website to see what is something that she would be likely to be eligible for. It's also important that she asked her high school counselor if the school has a packet of all the local scholarships. 
Elena's parents should also check out the financial institution and organizations that they are members of to see if they have scholarships available. Every dollar counts. One of my colleges also mentioned that Jackson County, Michigan has a student loan fund that offers low cost financing for a number of students. It's called the John George Junior Student Loan Fund. It provides $6,000 per year at 2% interest for a total of four years, so that's $24,000 in all, to attend a Michigan State supported college or university. There may be similar programs in your area, so it's really worth doing the research. Now, you have to remember, however, these types of funds are not eligible for forgiveness and deferment and things of that nature. So we've covered options for increasing money to offset the cost of college, but we also need to look at ways to reduce costs. One option is advanced placement uh, test through the College Board organization. So students take a class in high school, uh, take a special test proctored, proctored by the high school on a given day. All students across the country are taking the same test. The student shares their test score with their college, and the college will waive that class requirement depending on score. So for example, scoring a five on the AP Physics class, it counted for eight credits uh, for my son, and it fulfilled both the science and lab requirement um, for his degree. Now, another option is dual enrollment. This is where high school students can take college-level classes while in, enrolled in high school. What's great about this program is these classes are paid for by the school district. CLEP, which is college-level examination program, allows a student to get college credit with what they know. Uh, military people can actually take these tests for free, although they're typically $89. There are 34 exams, and they cover intro-level college course material. Um, so I'll give an example. My son took an introduction to computing through the CLEP. He paid $89 for two credits, which is awesome. He even used the books that a friend had bought to actually take the class. So using these AP and CLEP and if available dual enrollment, it really allows the student to graduate much quicker because and they're paying fewer credits at college prices. So graduating quicker also reduce room and board expenses. Now, speaking of living expenses, uh, we spoke earlier about Elena maybe commuting to college. Another way to cut the cost of lodging is to apply to be a resident assistant, an RA. Um, Many colleges give RAs free accommodation. However, you typically need at least 40 credits to be an RA, but it's something that have, would have to be done in you know, um, a different year. You couldn't do this as a freshman. And obviously, you have to apply. And so it's all about success. Um, so remember, you'll be able to access these resources that we mentioned through the website link uh, provided on each page. So we encourage you to, to check those out. So in summary, Knowing these costs, Elena has to decide what type of education works best for her. She has to do all she can to reduce the cost of college. Remember, with the FAFSA, early bird gets the worm. Same can be true of scholarships and other funding, such as the example we shared, the John George Junior Student Loan Fund. And finally, it's about affordability. Elena must have a strategy for paying back the student loans, and that's the missing link, I think, for most students. They, they have little to no understanding of what that repayment will look like, and that's why this work is, is important. Now, we've also included a college prep checklist here. It's a great source and resource um, with, I mean, it has action items from kindergarten to 12th grade. There's also a section for adult students, too. So there's a lot of great information available about student loans, and we're going to be sharing, you know, all of these, the slides and the website references via email with you um, later today. Um, but per the Department of Education's 2016 blog, all the information you need to resolve student loan issues and pick the best repayment plan is ready, readily available. You can do this. However, sometimes making the phone calls can be scary. And it's easier when you have an advocate. And that's what Green Path can be and where we can come alongside you and make those calls with you. And I would check out our website for more information because there is a cost associated with these particular types of counseling. Now, I've also shared a great blog post from a very happy customer of the Green Path Student Loan Counseling. So it's a great way to get a sense of what exactly do we do? Because um, this person is speaking from our own experience and how we were able to assist her. 
So we've obviously gone through a lot of information here, and I'm going to pass it over now to Doug to kind of tie up the, our webinar today. Thank you. Green Path is a nation nonprofit, uh, nationwide nonprofit uh, that provides financial education and tools for people to lead financially healthy lives. If you do have any further questions um, about Green Path, you can visit us at greenpath.com, or when you get to that website, there's a number you can call for free one-on-one -on -one budget counseling sessions to talk about your specific situation. Now, we also would like to open up the floor uh, to questions, and we already have had a couple questions come into the chat, but please feel free to type your questions into the chat, and 